We've processed most of the material that'll be used for the base, or at least the legs on the base, some of those long pieces I did will be stretchers running back and forth. But now it's time to break these down into the components they need to start getting glued up. I've been referencing my model that I did in Fusion 360, took some notes that only make sense to me because that's the way my notes always go to figure out how we need to cut these so we can start gluing them up. And uh, here we go. I normally only work with fully milled fresh wood. You'll notice I haven't done that this time. This is wood from a family farm out in Iowa. This was a corn crib built right as corn cribs were going uh, out, of, out of fashion and everyone was moving to grain elevators, but they wanted to keep as much history and patina of the wood as possible. So I tried to mill it just enough to have you know, edges and squareness and things that I can reference and good glue surfaces. So as I move through it, I'm going to try to make sure that the sides with character are out and visible, and, but then I still have good glue surfaces to go in the good side where things need to get glued up. But yeah, that's some of the stuff I'll be working around. And uh, for those that are wondering, because this isn't my normal style, that's why. The first set of glue ups are done. I oriented these because they're actually going to be cut down narrower. So that way any bad parts of the wood that need to get cut away are on the side are together to get cut away. And then also made sure that the pieces with the character I wanted to keep was going to be on the outside. And all the stuff that was really fresh planed well was on the inside for a good blue glue bond. So we got all the glue edges cleaned up. They shifted a little bit so my edges weren't perfectly aligned. So I got all those clued up with the table saw and stuff. And I laid this out with my sketch and notes according to the design. I think I know where I can put dominoes where they're not gonna be a problem. We're gonna use dominoes to keep this from slipping. So time to lay those out, get all the dominoes cut, start doing these glue ups. And then we'll go to the CNC and find out if we screwed anything up. Got both sets glued up, ended up taking it in stages just because so many different pieces here. So I did the two ends and added the middle, as you saw. And CNC's on pause right now, but the other thing we've been doing is troubleshooting uh, just the CNC program, make sure everything's gonna go smooth because these are some really deep cuts and some dense, dense material. Right now I'm working on cutting what'll be the actual foot and then the header piece that'll be right, that'll connect to the tabletop. Um, so yeah, we'll get these out of clamps soon and time for some CNZ action. Got them out of clamps. This one, just a little bit of twist introduced through all the glue ups. We're doing rustic, so not a big deal. Um, when I was doing this though, I pulled out four dominoes for the last glue up and I had three, but I couldn't, couldn't find the last one. Don't know what happened to it. But this one we got out of clamps. It's got a lot more rock, um, way more 
than is acceptable to me. But it solved a question, and I can't believe I was this stupid. But, see this? I, uh, I found the missing domino. Yeah, I did. I did a glue up on a bloody domino. Fortunately, this isn't a disaster. Just gonna go to the bandsaw and fix it. Not perfectly flat, it's rustic. The wood's rough still, but it's not. There's no dominoes under it. Fortunately, uh, with the timeline, you know, this needs to be in clamp for two hours as a clamp time for tight bond. Uh, these will be one hour cuts each on the CNC. This will probably be like a two hour cut. So it's not really putting us behind, just aggravating, but uh, hopefully funny for you, except for everyone that's gonna unsubscribe because I'm so stupid now, apparently. But uh, normally I hide it well, this time I just didn't. This is the bottom piece of the legs. Already ran them on the CNC. Learned a lot doing those pass, did these off camera. Now it's time to do the tops. The tops are the same, except they're not gonna have this indention that creates the foot. It's just gonna be flat all the way across. Um, this half inch groove though was quite a lot for the CNC. So the first thing we're gonna do to these pieces is rip them down closer to width. So when that bit comes along and cuts the perimeter, it doesn't have to hog out its whole width. It'll just take a little bit off each side. That'll take a lot of stress off the machine. Yeah, but uh, I could easily do this on the bandsaw. I'm just trying to flex those CNC muscles and uh, get get better at running that thing. So that way when I have jobs where that's really the tool for it, I've kind of got my chops. Um, this one cut most of the way through. This other one, we only made it about halfway. And then CNC started struggling with the end grain. I think these boards were just a little bit denser. Um, but either way, the steps for finishing these out are the same. I'm just gonna go to the bandsaw, rough it out, and then use a template router bit to finish it, which is another way that we could have approached doing these legs, is either bandsaw all of, like, uh, table saw the straight pits, bandsaw out the curves, and then either take a belt sander to it, or we could have used a CNC to make a template or made a template by hand and then use that template to then hand router it. There's lots of ways to achieve things without a CNC. Just sometimes you can get more accuracy like we're doing now or maybe faster, or it's just the fact that that's working on it while I can do other things. I mean, it works beautifully because with the sheer uh, action of the CNC, right, just pushing laterally, it's not going to break the hold, but the adhesive on the tape isn't strong enough that, you know, if you can just get a little angle on it, it rips right off. You just run through a bunch of tape and CA glue when you do it, but, you know, when people send you all those things for free, who cares how much you use? Switched over to the legs, about to cut these out. Made a little mistake that I'll explain later. But anyways, first thing I'm gonna do, because this is a pretty complicated pattern, is do an air cut, make sure everything is positioned fine, so I'm gonna get the whole cut out of my material. To speed up that process, because I have this running really slow, taking really shallow passes, I set my Z high, so it'll actually do an air cut, which is tracing the same pattern, but above the material so it doesn't cut anything, because if it's wrong, well, you just ruined your material. And I also told it to ignore the feed in the program so I can tell it to run a lot faster than it normally would. So let's uh, make sure it's going to run right. So 
so it's starting to bounce off the excess. It started making a racket and this started shooting out the machine. That is the back of my bandsaw tire. You can see the lip of the uh, wheel there. No good. Not glued up, just got the three components together. This is the concept for the legs. There's one piece missing that I could have done on the CNC, and that's I need a hole right here in the middle for a stretcher that's gonna go through and have some joinery things holding it together. I can't remember, think of the names right now. So I could have had this pocket um, done in the same uh, tool path that cut everything, but I don't have that piece milled yet, and I was really nervous about this operation and didn't wanna to try to put too many things in there together. So I need to mill that stretcher to the dimension so I know what size to make this hole, then we can model that up and uh, run that to get cut. And then once that's done, then we'll be ready to assemble these. Now the error I made, I think I might've mentioned earlier that I made an error. You'll see that this um, curve isn't smooth. There's kind of this little notch here. That was because I pulled on my dimensions from the model to build the blank for these. And I made an error in that these were wider than they needed to be and I meant to shave them down. Then I forgot. Um, put it together, so ended up tweaking the model some. I like this shape better than the original model to try to get it to fit, but it just didn't quite make it. But I actually really, really like the way that kind of ties in with just the really rough theme. So I'm gonna leave it. What I was gonna do is take an off cut and glue an off cut in there and sand it down. Like, aside from glue time, it's maybe a 15 minute fix, so obviously not a big deal, but I think this kind of fits the vibe of what we got going on here better. Now the fix for that, what I should have done, since I had a file in the CNC, is cut a template out of hardboard or MDF or something and use that template, which would have been the you know exact perfect shape, and then laid out all my pieces on it to build the blank, then glued up the blank with the template, then I'd know that when I went to the CNC, the blank would be correct for what I'm making. The other thing I could have done is just made a whole blank, but I didn't have the material, enough material to just do a whole size blank and waste it all. So enough talking, let's uh, get that stretcher down to size and punch some holes in things. One of these boards, I made sure it was in the middle, um, was pretty punky. We're going to use um, a Total Boat Fix Wood. It's a two-part epoxy wood filler. It's super durable, but because it was punky before we can do that, had to add some penetrating epoxy. So I mixed that in and I'm just, you know, slathering it on as it soaks in to get this nice and firm before we add some more wood to it. Okay, so recutting the shoulders on what's gonna be the stretcher. This was the piece you last saw us working with, but it's just too rough. We're gonna smooth it down some, but it's got this big round over kind of on it, which I liked, but it's also super out of square and I wasn't sure how to handle the mortises. Part of me was saying, you know, it'll just be oversized and there'll be gaps, but I, Mm, it's just not how I work, uh, had a problem. So this piece still has some character. Um, 
it's gonna look good. So I went to the jointer and used the jointer to establish some shoulders. And now where my, uh, you know, cutter head left a little roundy bit, I'm just knocking, nibbing this off with the saw. And now we'll have a square, definitely a rectangle that we need to cut out the CNC. It's gonna be a lot easier to do to establish the mortise on the legs for that stretcher to go through. So feel a lot better about this. There's gonna be a wedge that goes in here to tighten everything and pull it all together. So this needs to have an angled slope. So I'm gonna use a tapered bit to do that. I was trying to figure out the right way to approach it. I never tried this technique before, but the entire bit doesn't cut. It does have a smooth shank. So what I'm doing is lowering this bit enough that the part that doesn't cut is sticking out below the nut and I'll r run that smooth part in this little shelf that I just made um, as a guide, kind of like a bearing, and that'll hopefully keep me straight. The reason I'm doing that, instead of using a fence, is there's not enough room on this side to put a fence for my router base, so it'd have to be on this side, and then I've got to like, to, it's just, it's not gonna work. So, gonna give this a try. The way I've done this before in the past is cut a wedge on the table saw or wherever, clamp it in place so then I have a slope surface, and then just use a chisel and using the ramp as a guide for the chisel. But I like mixing things up and uh, making it hard on myself instead of just getting good at one technique. Another reason for doing it this way is one of the ways I did it last time was in just soft maple, I wanna say, but trying to chisel that end grain was a nightmare because it's super hard and this oak is also ridiculously hard, I've learned. So trying to chisel that end grain is gonna be a nightmare. Another reason for the router. I have the wedge mortises cut in both sides. Of course, the leg isn't on here. A few no notes on making these. This bigger line that goes all the way across, that's the one I marked where the leg is. You can see I cut behind that a little bit, so without the leg in place, this really slides. And the reason for that is so when I drive the wedge, it actually pushes against the leg and doesn't just wedge itself in here, but doesn't actually push the leg any tighter. Another thing you wanna do is you notice this slides in pretty easy and that it has a little bit of wiggle in this direction. The reason for that is what I want this wedge to do is push against this side and the leg when it's here. I don't want it forcing the sides apart. So you want it just a little bit loose this way. So that way we're actually getting the force where we need it. Now we can get to putting the whole leg assembly together at the middle piece, top and bottom. I'm gonna domino these and you can see I've already made two marks on each one. Um, this isn't quite wide enough to get two dominoes side by side, so what I'm gonna do is play with the, the depth setting and set one domino farther back and one a little bit closer. I'm doing both dominoes from one side because these don't quite line up perfectly, so I don't wanna have to, if I try to come from both sides, then the dominoes aren't gonna line up, so just sticking with one side.
So these dudes are glued up. We've got all of our joinery ready. So next is going to be our top stretchers, which are gonna sit on the top of the base. So we need to get this all together so we can get those exact measurements. We have the base together as much as things are made to go together. These are gonna set across the top and get dovetailed in. They'll provide some support for the weight in the top, especially in the middle, but really the top's so thick, it doesn't need any help. What this mostly is gonna do is since we only have one stretcher in the middle of this base, the even though it's wedged, the base might kinda of wanna you know move this way or have some racking. Dovetailing these into the top is gonna to make sure that we have a solid shape. Um, with tables, the big thing to remember is you need rectangles, right? So as it is, without these, we don't have any rectangles. We have two sides and one piece. Once we have pieces on top, then we have that top stretcher, the legs, and then the middle stretcher. So we do have a rectangle. Once you have a rectangle that's all joined together, you have a strong base. Got the base buttoned up, time to start working on the top. The client really wants to keep as much of the patina as possible. Um, so we're just gonna skip plane it. I'm gonna try to joint it. Fortunately, this is really straight. It's got just the slightest bit of waviness, but um, if I jointed it and then tried to run it through the planer, it just wouldn't have the same feel as it is if we just do a very light skip plane. So we're going to uh, cut these down a little bit closer to final length because these are big and heavy running through the skip planer and then we can start joining this thing together it's going to be real fun on the top as we're doing some breadboard ends so that changes the math a little bit but i've already ran all the figures time to do this This red oak is absolutely beautiful. Uh, Robbie got real curious in those cross sections. He counted one of them and was able to count 101 rings. So she was at least 100 years old and who knows how much more growth there was. But anyway, running it through the planer, I tried to take as light of a pass as I could from eyeballing it. And you can see it took away pretty much all the patina. This board has just small pockets of it left because it's actually pretty, pretty small layer of patina we have. So this is gonna be the bottom. If I was able to control it, I was gonna skip playing both sides, but since I wasn't and we just chewed through it all and we have to leave that, this is gonna become the bottom and we'll glue it up this way after we rip all the sides and get it all jointed well. And then for the top, we're just going to sand it. It's gonna take a while, but uh, sand it down to the level we want. So that's just a note. If you do these kind of jobs with reclaimed wood and people want to keep that and it's a uh, you know one shot kind of thing where you don't have extra material to play with, Make sure you build um, that risk and time into your pricing.
So obviously off camera, we went ahead and glued one up just to kind of get our sequence. Because this is such a big top, I'm only gonna do one glue joint at a time. So it'll take three glue ups to get these two boards together. Do one side, the other half, then put the two halves together. But speaking of the other halves, most of these boards were really good and are gonna be great. But one of them, this one with all the cracks in it, has the pith, the heart, where, where the tree started as, as a sapling running through it. And when this hit the ground, uh, well, you see what happened. And I do not want that happening to this when we're moving around once it's all glued up and it's got a lot of weight because that joint's gonna have a lot of uh, force on it. So I'm gonna mix up some Total Boat High Performance 2 to 1 to fill these cracks to stabilize it. Um, thick set would be the way I would like to go just because it's more viscous. So it will penetrate into these cracks a lot quicker. I won't have to keep chasing it. But because these cracks are so thin, it'll take that thick set probably a good three days to actually hit its full cure because it's not deep enough to really go exo exothermic. Um, so the two to one will be a lot quicker um, as far as dry time, but we'll have to keep nursing it as it kind of gets in there and starts flowing. But uh, time to mix it up. So we'll do like two second clips of me stirring this in a bunch of places. So these dudes are out of the clamps. We have both halves together. When we glued them up, we glued them up to try to keep the tops as flat as possible. And in so doing, we've got a little bit of unevenness here on the bottom. So we're gonna send them both through the planer. But working with these wider slabs, I confirmed something I suspected, which is my planer knives in this beast are not totally parallel to the bed. So one side is actually cutting a little narrower than the other, it's making a slight wedge. So to counteract that, what we're gonna do is send it through, spin it around, send it through again. Um, my geometry savvy viewers are going to say, oh, but isn't that probably gonna make like a slight peak in the middle? It's all glued up. Again, we're trying to keep a lot of this patina. I think I've said that like 10 times. So we're gonna sand this down. But before we do that, uh, the client wanted some colored epoxy spots and we have a few natural places that lean towards that, but not enough to really kind of set this piece off. So where some of these knot holes are, I'm gonna try to trace them best I can, route them out since, I mean, they might end up popping out eventually anyways to give us a few more places to put some epoxy. So with sanding this, discovered a few things. I was hoping to get through all the mold, didn't, that's okay. Um, and also when we were dusting it off and sanding, th some of these boards just have some really loose, kind of soft stuff. I think these top planks are actually fur or spruce or, or something. But anyway, to deal with the mold, I've just got some alcohol diluted with a little bit of water. We'll spray that on, that'll kill it. And then the next step after that is going to be a penetrating epoxy, but penetrating epoxy over the whole thing that'll firm up 
all the wood, so it'll make a nice, good surface. This would actually be a pretty prime candidate for doing a tabletop flood coat, but we're doing breadboards, and personally, I'm not a fan of like flood coat epoxies. I like, I like feeling the wood, so that's the way we're gonna handle this. Penetrating epoxies had time to dry, came back and did a light sanding on everything with the Merca and some Abernet, worked great. Now it's time to start working on the breadboard ends. I have them set where they're gonna go. So we're gonna mark it. I'm gonna do a slightly in unconventional approach in how I get these cut. It's gonna generate some problems, but solve some others. We'll talk about that after I do it because you're gonna see me. And when you see me do it, you'll know what I'm doing. To secure the breadboard ends, I'm going to use some dowels that are the drawboard to help pull it in. Um, because my tendon is three inches, I want these in the middle, it's an inch and a half. Got an inch and a half piece of aluminum that helped me use that, then use tape measure and pencil to mark the center of each board. Um, these are handy tools. If you're not familiar with them, I, I can't help you. But what I'd love to do is instead of four, one in the middle of each board would be one in the middle and then two more on either side. However, I don't want to drill a hole right through that glue joint and then put the dowel in that glue joint. Probably fine. I just don't want to do it. So I'm not because I'm making this and I make the decisions. So now that I've got everything marked, I can start drilling the holes. The big idea is to just drill only through the first layer of this breadboard. So I'll drill a hole through here. Then I'll, I'll just show you. Now that I've drilled through the top, I'm gonna mark on the bottom board, the center of the hole, and then drill a hole through them just a smidge forward. So when I drive the pegs, it sucks it against the table. All right, my notice on the ends, I wiggled it some to elongate the hole. That was not for its pleasure. That's so when I put the dowel in there as the table expands and contracts throughout the seasons, it's gonna move this way. Whereas this breadboard, the grain is oriented perpendicular. Whenever you have perpendicular wood grain, that's when move, wood movement may become an issue. So having that hole elongated means that this little dude gets to go, whoa, and slip around in there as it needs to while the table moves so we don't have to worry about it cracking itself or anything. So with that as well, we wanna make sure we don't glue it in that hole and lock it in place. We want it to be able to move, but we do want these pegs glued, but only glued in the top. So to help make sure I do that, what we'll do is mark the depth here on these dudes. And now I know once I pound past that pencil line, I can add a little bit of glue, 
slip it in the rest of the way, and then it's only going to be glued to the breadboard, not to the tabletop. And as far as gluing this, again, same purpose. We don't want to glue the whole surface because then the tabletop won't be able to slide inside the breadboard. So we're just going to put some glue in the middle. Why are we still gluing it if we're pegging it? I don't know. It's just what you do. On to the fun part. We have some defects, holes and stuff in the wood that we're gonna fill with some tinted epoxy. Um, kinda wanted a custom mix, so I pre-mix my proprietary blend of pigment here, so that way when we get to the top, which you're gonna do later, I'll have some pre-mix left over if I don't use this all. So yeah, using Total Boat High Performance 2 to 1 is again for the set time. However, this time I want to make sure there's no bubbles, so we got the vacuum chamber out to degas. And like before, and anytime you work with pigment, the rule is always make sure you mix adequately. However, since this does have a quick set time, i um, got the power drill out with the mixer to help make sure we uh, get it thoroughly mixed, but quickly. Finally, I'm gonna spray finish using my gold standard Total Boat Halcyon. Uh, this is the amber, which is gloss, and then I'll come back and top coat with clear satin. Oh shoot, then I have to, uh, I've also got to domino the attachment points afterwards. I always forget to do that before I finish. But yeah, almost done. So glamour shot kind of thing now, because this is fun. Finish is all cured and I cut the little domino holes that I forgot to do so I can actually attach the top to the base. We're gonna take it out back and get some glamour shots for you guys and then it'll be time to deliver. So stay tuned for that. Anyway, though, I hope you learned something, were inspired or at least entertained. And until next time, make time to make something.
I did a glue up on a bloody domino. Now you domino where it is. That was <laughs> so bad. So I got the base.